find the balance for the chair so that it's here. So we want to let it fall. And as it's coming up, we bring it over. Over, fall, over, fall, over. Free energy machines. In this video, I will explain how to build several free energy machines. No details shall be spared. They are strictly mechanical devices, not electric, except for the one bonus concept. So they don't require electrical circuits that are supposedly supposed to uh, provide free energy. It's all mechanical, so it's very simple. Special thank you to Sir Timothy Thrapp, Timothy Martin, Dr. J, and the entire WITS team. So there are three forces uh, in nature for free energy that are very obvious. Uh, buoyancy, density differences. Uh, so uh, an object will float in water or an air bubble will bubble up in water. Second one is gravity. The third one is centripetal or centrifugal force. So the easiest thing is a buoyancy motor. This uses water density for acceleration density difference. So this picture is supposed to be a joke, but uh, it didn't even spell lighter, right? Um, it's supposed to be a joke, but it actually works. Of course, uh, it's difficult to get a proper seal on the bottom, so you have to add air on the bottom. And this picture is from lockhaven.edu. They say it's an unworkable idea. This means that it doesn't work for the energy monopoly because they cannot make money from it. So here's a picture from Patrick J. Kelly's Guide to Free Energy. Uh, so you can have big buckets. You can make them out of concrete. They could hold tons of water and you could run an air hose down and uh, just put a little bubble of air inside and it would displace the water. Mm -hmm. So um, you could go down say a quarter mile down a lake and a tiny bubble of air would become a great big bubble by the time you got to the surface. Uh, so you can run an airline or if there's too much pressure you could use an air pipe. Run it down from the surface. Buckets could be made of concrete and hold thousands of pounds of water. A small bubble of air down a quarter mile becomes a very large bubble by the time it comes to the surface. Timothy Thrapp said he built one in Alaska and put it into a lake. This machine can produce a lot of power but requires access to deep water and uh, probably expensive parts that aren't going to rust like stainless steel parts. So it's expensive, but it does produce a lot of power. Now, Patrick J. Kelly passed away July 2020. There's a lot of good information in this PDF book, but as a friend of mine put it, most of the machines require Timothy Thrapp's input to get them to actually work. Now, the second device is a seesaw gravity motor. So... A heavy seesaw is close to being balanced, but the balance shifts from side to side to keep it rocking back and forth. Now here's Timothy Thrapp with his one that he built, and his page wasn't big enough, so I modified it. Now he says make it at least six feet, teeter-totter or reciprocating gravity motor. And he said that he coined the word gravity motor. Before that it was called a Perpetua mobile or perpetual motion. So I kind of modified this 
So we have a solid pieces on each side, it's called a stator. Um, now the seesaw or teeter-totter doesn't move very quickly so you should have a very heavy rocker so that it will have a lot of inertia when it comes down. Yeah, so it kind of slowly rocks back and forth. Um, the force of gravity is pretty weak. Uh, I drew a different design. So you put solid steel here and then you could just put a pipe on top that slides back and forth. The principle of this machine is simple. You use the force of gravity to shift the balance sideways. And uh, most people probably have seen this device. Uh, it does use magnets and it doesn't produce usable power, but it does keep spinning. It is a perpetual motion machine. And um, there's a train track on it here, perhaps. It's an older design. Maybe he took the train track off. But it is a piece of art. It's not practical. Okay, third, spinning gravity motor. Okay. That would be a spinning gravity motor. A word on building your machine. Friction adds up quickly. The simpler the machine is, the better. I have a joke that my machines only work if you take off all the parts because the parts actually hinder it from spinning. Sliders have a lot of friction. You can use bars on a large arc instead of sliders so it doesn't go perfectly straight um, but it's a good compromise because you don't have much friction. There's also straight line mechanisms but again you're making it more complicated than it needs to be. Ramps do not work really well because there is so much friction involved, only pivots work. Also when you have weight coming in contact with a ramp, it's kind of like landing an airplane. You can try to do it smoothly, but there's always a certain amount of impact and it makes a vibration which, uh, you know, it turns your rotation motion, your velocity into vibrations and uh, your machine stops turning. There is a patent for this machine. Timothy Thrapp said he had one similar to this that worked. The sliders and ramps produce a huge amount of friction. I tried making devices like this. It did not go well. Now my skill level is not very high, but you know, it's still I don't think it's very practical. Uh, expensive, you know, it would be expensive to build something, you know, say four feet or more, you know, 50 pound weights, 20 pound weights. Timothy said make it at least four feet and use 20 pound weights. But like I said, um, uh, there's a lot of friction. Okay bonus. Pulsing coils on a wheel. So when a wheel is turning, if there's no friction, it'll stay turning forever. So you don't have to add power. So in real life, you have to add a little power, but if you have low friction bearings or uh, you can use magnetic levitation bearings uh, instead of bearings, I guess. Uh, a wheel is an interesting machine. Two objects on a wheel can be moving at different speeds but remain the same distance from each other. So you have two objects beside each other. One is a little further from the outside on the wheel and uh, they're both moving at a different speed but they're still beside each other. You can pulse coils on the inside of the wheel and have them energize coils on the outside or vice versa and because the coils are moving at different speeds uh, thank you, Timothy Thrapp, for the idea. So here's a diagram. The blue object moves faster than the green object, but they always remain beside each other. Now, here are some machines that don't work, and we know these don't work, um, basically because the wheel balances itself out, and they don't have a second axis. Um, 
which I suppose you might be able to use a spring for a second axis. Um, I have something I made, if I can find it quickly. Um, where is it? Here we go. This was my idea I had maybe over a year ago. Where you have a spring, like a clock spring, that would like fly out and then fly back in. See, so it flies way back in too quickly there. Um, but basically, that, you know, it wouldn't work. Probably not, or it would be hard to get it to work. And if it did, it wouldn't really produce any power. Uh, so they don't have a second axis and they balance themselves out. Now I'll show you what a second axis is later. The overbalanced wheel, okay? And I tried making one of these and well, I didn't have to, I just needed to look on Google. But you can see it's supposed to turn counterclockwise, but there's more weights on the side that's going up. So that's why these things don't work. Um, so it would actually go backwards and then stop. Okay, here is something Timothy was working on. But you can see how it slides. It's got that pivot in the center for a second axis. Okay. So let's open this. Copy. So Ron Brandt built this device. After seeing Timothy Thrapp's gravity motors, Ron Brandt built his own using one weight. Uh, Timothy's owl had multiple weights. Um, he didn't make any with one weight uh, until Ron did. So I guess Ron understood the principle and he simplified it. The device was similar to the one pictured, but included a spring. It was about nine inches around, and the weight was a two inch round steel cylinder. It was about two inches long. Okay, so it needs a spring here. The spring and the second pivot had to be adjusted to where Ron called the sweet spot. It would spin up to 200 to 300 RPM. And uh, Ron said, well, it's kind of useless. And Timothy said, well, what if you scaled it up? Then maybe you could harness some power off it. And he said, yeah, well, maybe. And this device is not only a gravity motor, but also a centripetal centrifugal force motor. I use the term centripetal slash centrifugal because one cannot exist without the other. The force of gravity is quite weak, so centrifugal force must be utilized for a working gravity motor. Uh, basically, I mean, technically. Uh, you could Technically you could make a gravity motor that only ran on the force of gravity, but because the forces of gravity are quite weak, it's not easy or practical. Okay, this is with the spring. Um, there's a picture of Ron Brandt. And this is, let's open this up. Now this is just a model. It's a trick, but it's cool to see how it actually works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, he's got a motor running it. Don't be fooled. Needs a spring and the weight's too small. DE Project built a model of the device. Uh, it doesn't run on its own power. The weight's too small and it misses, it's missing a spring. 
The E-Project uses hidden motors and belts in his machines, but he does make very good models, so you can thank him for that. Ron tried to make his machine work without a spring, but he couldn't. He thought it should work without a spring, but I'll explain below why the spring is necessary. Okay, so let's do some math. If we have a pendulum, and we have this green stand here, and it starts in position one, and then we remove the stand, it goes over to position two. So when it gets to position two, it stays in the air for an infinitely small amount of time. It's just resting still, and then it speeds up again. So it has enough force to hold it up there without that stand for a very brief period of time. So you could say that um, the force added to the weight every half a period, which is every swing, uh, would be mass times gravity. Now the force of gravity is constant, but the velocity of the weight changes. So the acceleration depends on the angle. So let's uh, let's talk about that. Okay, look, if we measured from the bottom, I know my notes are hard to read, but uh, the force of gravity uh, on the weight, so the acceleration, would be gravity times the sine of theta. Uh, so at the very bottom, you'd have zero force, and if the weight was at 90 degrees, uh, so about, you know, maybe... 50 or 40 degrees here, maybe maybe 50 from the bottom, or uh, 30 from the bottom, 40 from the bottom. Uh, so um, the more it falls like vertically, uh, the more force is on it, uh, or the more acceleration, because you see the center pivot absorbs some of that energy, or you could say you could lose efficiency when the force of gravity isn't um, the same as a, a tangential velocity. Okay. So if you move the axis, like if you moved it sideways, as it was falling, then the weight would remain at that angle for longer. So it would accelerate down more. And then if you just held it there, it would, it would go all the way up and then over and you did the same thing. Uh, or if you had like a string, then it would wrap around a cylinder or a wheel to bring it inwards, so it had to go up less, and then you would have to have it unwind somehow, maybe as it's going down, it would unwind, but um, moving the center axis is difficult, and it's difficult to make a good machine that will move the axis at the right time, like there's some some of the designs that people have tried to make. You know, they're just not so good. So simple is better. Um, so a simple machine that does work is better than a more complicated one that could possibly work, but doesn't actually work. So gravity power, the force of gravity is very weak, but it is harnessable. And so I'll explain how Ron used centrifugal force with gravity. There is no such thing as angular momentum or angular velocity, and it's made up. It's a summary of what happens when an object turns around a fixed radius. If you change the radius, the forces don't cancel out in the same way. Uh, motion always goes straight unless a force is to, applied to it. For example, when you throw an object, 
continues to go straight, except gravity pulls it down and uh, wind may move it too. Okay, so here we have a center and a string and an object. So the object is always moving straight, but the string and the center are always changing the direction of motion. When a spinning object is released, it always goes straight. Here the string, before it broke, applied an acceleration 90 degrees to the velocity direction of the object. So it changed the angle of the velocity, but not its magnitude. But the center of the string applied a real force to the object. So we would say, well, it's a real force. Now, isn't that usable energy? How do we harness that? Uh, so energy or work is force times distance over time. So it applied a force, so it moved that yellow ball towards the center, but it actually didn't move further or closer away from the center. See that? It didn't move along the force it was applied. Similarly, if you set a book on the surface, the surface negates the force of gravity on the object, bringing it into a neutral state. But no work is done because the book did not move. So the weight actually has to move in or out. And the force is actually outward. It's difficult to bring it in. Uh, okay. So this is da Vinci's flywheel, one of them. The above photo demonstrates how centrifugal force will oppose gravity and provide a certain amount of lift. Without friction, it does not require any energy to keep a weight spinning. So, so that would just spin forever and it would oppose gravity. The centrifugal force provides free energy lift to the weight. However, once a weight reaches its maximum height, which is based on the centrifugal force, based on the speed and the weight, it doesn't move up or down, so it doesn't change its height, so no work is being done. The weight would have to be brought down so that the centrifugal force could do work on it by lifting it up again. So this brings us to our next section. We want the weight to go in and out because it wants to go out, uh, but it's difficult to bring it in. So we don't lose energy when it goes out, and we don't lose energy when it goes in, but it's difficult to bring it in. The centrifugal force exists between the center of rotation and the outside. The centrifugal force is the object's inertia resisting a change in direction. So an object has inertia, and that means it wants to go straight and it doesn't want to change its direction. The heavier the object, the more inertia, the more resistance to change in direction. When we bring the weight inwards, it rotates faster and the centrifugal force increases. However, the speed of the weight does not change, but because it has a smaller circumference to follow, it takes less time to cover. So it the rotation speed is faster. If we bring the weight outwards, its speed also remains the same, but the circumference is larger, so the rotational speed is reduced. In physics, the speed of the weight is called the tangential velocity. The weight has inertia, which goes straight, and resists change in direction. So, uh, this makes the weight fly outward from the center. It's because to go, keep going in a circle, it has to keep turning, and it doesn't want to turn. It wants to go straight. So the harnessable force is the centrifugal force, which is the object's resistance to change of its direction of motion. Let's bring this picture back up nicer to look at. Uh, 
All right, so the motion's in a circle, centripetal acceleration, velocity. It's just introductory physics stuff. Because the force, uh, the centrifugal force, is from the inside to the outside, the weight has to be allowed to move outwards, and then it must be brought back in for the process to repeat. So you have a change of velocity from the inside to the outside, so that's work. Okay, so here's my notes. My notes are very bad. Okay, motion always goes straight. Centripetal is inward pull. Uh, motion is velocity and doesn't change on its own. Right, so a force has to be applied for velocity to change, like friction is a force, slows it down. Centripetal acceleration. Uh, centripetal is acceleration which changes the angle, the direction of the velocity vector, but not its magnitude. Centrifugal force is a velocity or inertia or motion's resistance to changing direction. I just started calling it motion because I was using inertia and momentum and apparently I wasn't using the right words so I just made it up. I, I call it motion. Motion goes straight. Okay, so our power source is the resistance the change of direction of motion, centrifugal force, covered most of this. So I have some nice little arrows here from the inside to the outside. Centripetal, centrifugal, that's where the force is, from the inside to the outside. In order for the centripetal force to be harnessed, it must act on a mass. Therefore, it must move the weight away from the center, so we will also need to bring it back to the center to harness the centrifugal force again. Ron's device has two axes. The second axis brings the weight back into the center. When the weight goes to the outside, it compresses a spring. The spring is a mechanism which harnesses the centrifugal force. The spring pushes on the weight as it goes back in, accelerating the wheel. The key identifier in all working gravity motors or centrifugal, centripetal machines is the two fixed centers or axis, two fixed axis. Okay, so I have a list of some machines I've looked at. Skinner's machine, William Skinner, Gravity Power 1939. Uh, I got a picture of that somewhere. Somewhere. Here we go. I got some of the watermark off of it too. Uh, it's very difficult to tell what's going on in this machine, but I figured it out after six months. Okay, we'll go back to that. Okay, so here's some of my bad drawings. Okay, you can take Ron's motor, um, in case you forgot, to go back to it. That's what it would look like. There's Ron. I believe he died in 2010. <coughs> 2010. And um, that's what his machine would look like. Okay, so my drawings of it. They're really bad, I know. Um, if we replace this bar that holds the uh, weight with two bars, then we could imagine if it didn't have any centrifugal force on it, it would just stay close to the center. It wouldn't go out from the center ever. But if there's centrifugal force, it goes out from the center and then has to come back in. So there's really two steps to harnessing uh, the mechanical energy from a spinning object. Uh, step one, harness the centrifugal force by having it move away outwards from the center and then have another mechanism that brings the weight back in. 
Number two, convert the linear motion of the weight moving outwards to rotational motion. This is the output. Now that we understand the key to harnessing the power from a wheel, we can understand some perpetual motion machines of the past. Okay, William Skinner's machine. I should have put a photo in here. Silly me. Wait a second. How do I have it that? that. There we go. Isn't that beautiful? I'm bring my wheel back. Okay, so here's some drawings of how it works. Um, or how people thought it worked. So, they thought that the orbit was elliptical. Which is not correct, but you know I've tried a lot of things that didn't work, so I forgive them. And here's some other drawings. Well, it's pretty accurate. Now Skinner's machine uses a gimbal in the center. Uh, you see that in the center, and I do not like that. So I have designed a version that uses a fixed center shaft and does not require a gimbal. Okay, another one of my bad drawings. So, there's a center shaft here. Let's turn on the cursor. Okay, there's a center shaft here and so that's fixed and that makes our second axis there. Then we have like a, a pipe here. I just, just mark tube with bearings. So that spins around the center shaft. Uh, and obviously, uh, yeah, you gotta have center shaft really solid. Um, so that spins around. And uh, uh, that would be, you would have, instead of, a slider for your weight you would have like a long arc um, so it's basically Ron's machine built a little different flipped on its side uh, so here we have a drive motor fixed center shaft and the second axis and the weight so if you can picture in your head the top weight here would spin around and if it didn't have any centrifugal force it would just leave this output shaft in the same place but the centrifugal force it would pull it outwards and then of course the, the second axis would pull it back in um, so um, uh, well I'll take a video of it when I build it this device is exactly like Ron, Ron Brandt's motor, uh, except the output is the bottom weight. The bottom shaft is moved instead of the spring, and that is the output. Uh, since this machine is laid on the flat, it doesn't run itself uh, because it can't doesn't utilize gravity. But you could make it to run itself once you got it going. Uh, you can put two bars together on the second axis so it doesn't have to move the bottom shaft if there is not enough centrifugal force. And it took me six months to figure out how this machine works. Okay, here's something Timothy was working on. It's incomplete, but we can see the two axis principle. Now uh, here's a buzzsaw gravity motor. I'm still not sure how this worked. Um, there might have been like a cusp that moved the weights in, but I think what happened is once they got up so high, the weight itself lost velocity or inertia and it fell down. Um, but there's some sort of mechanism that when it flew outward, 
it would provide acceleration. So there's some way of harnessing that force between the center and the weight. So um, when you have the weights moving sideways, it pushes back on the wheel. Uh, so it doesn't work right. It has to be from the center to the outside. It has to be in that direction, not 45 degrees from it. Um, important thing to look for is when the weights fly outward from the center and how that force is harnessed. And now here's Asa Jackson's wheel. Perpetual wheel. Um, perpetual motion machine. Now you can look that up. And the obvious clue is a hollow shaft in the center. Perhaps a fi fixed steel shaft went through the center and formed the second axis inside the center of the machine. That's just a theory, but why else would he have a hollow center shaft? So, this is a wheel inside a wheel, and there's brake shoes there. Uh, the machine, machine consists of two wheels, the inside having spring-loaded pins which engage wooden brake shoes. The weight or weights were likely cast iron or on the top part of the machine in the photo above or below. So, okay, the center is hollow. Um, there's two spools on ratchet mechanisms. This machine obviously was very complicated, but shows enough wear that it must have worked. People have examined it thoroughly. The teeth are quite worn. Um, also, it would have spun the output at incredible speeds. Okay, summary. Rembrandt's device is likely the most practical for small scale a tabletop demonstration and Skinner's machine is likely the most practical on a large scale. Uh, it's relatively compact and the weights or speed can be modified to provide more output. You might also have to modify the output too if you want it to run it at very high speeds um, because that might be based on gravity too. Um, gravity pulling the weight down, pulling against it. Um, there's different ways to uh, do the output, of course, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, basically, because you have like three axes. You have the main axis, the secondary axis, and then you would have your output, which is the weight moving from the center towards the outside. So you got two sides and you're trying to get three uh, bars or something in there so you kind of have to be creative. So that's why I like Skinner's machine uh, without the gimbal of course. So have fun and let me know how it goes and that's my email quantumenergysearch at gmail.com